project of this kind uh, globally. Uh, what we want to do uh, uh, is to make a database of women who are professionally engaged, and that database uh, you can find it on the website of the project. It presents uh, women uh, not just by their position but by their professional experience, uh, the companies uh, women are working in, the institutions, uh, and the most relevant projects each of the women uh, had during its career. Uh, this project actually is very good, and this database is actually very good for networking because as a result of this project we have some new initiatives which women uh, jointly developed and some partnerships and uh, apart from this uh, we conducted the first research uh, where we mapped women professional engaged and we asked them about their attitudes, position and roles in their careers and uh, also we uh, mapped uh, women in households like women in general and asked them what is their uh, what is their level of awareness about the topics of sustainable energy or climate change and uh, what are actually their behavior as uh, energy consumers. Uh, the study you can find on, uh, also on the website and uh, it's in English and in Serbian and this study was uh, selected by our uh, Gender Equality Institute in Serbia to be published as one of three publications for this year. And uh, in the next phase, we hope to develop this project in the region, that means not just in Serbia, where we piloted it successfully, but in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, and Macedonia as well. Uh, I would uh, like to present uh, the ladies, uh, wise women who are here, and because they are coming from different, in a way, different sectors, they are dealing with different topics in their professions, they have one thing in common, they are all uh, wise, they are all uh, really great professionals, and uh, they are 100% committed to sustainable development. Uh, we have Maya Turkovic with us. I will briefly introduce you with her biography. She's a sustainable energy expert with 20 years long professional career. She was engaged in advisory and consultancy work, government affairs, private equity investments, and civil society organizations. She started her career in the Electrical Engineer Institute Nikola Tesla Development. Later, she holds the television of Assistant Minister for the Power Sector in the Ministry of Mining and Energy. She was also one of the pioneers in the wind energy sector and one of the founders of the Serbian Wind Energy Association. Also co-owner and director of the large scale, first large scale wind project in Serbia. Uh, today Maya is um, in strategic investment planning and consulting in the field of renewable energy. She's also co-founder and board member of the civil society organization called ASSOR and uh, she was also very much engaged in the establishment of our WISE network. She authored or co-authored 23 papers and articles and holds a, a master degree uh, of uh, electrical engineering at the Belgrade University and MBA in Imperial College London's Business School. Impressive. <laughs> 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 Somehow I wanted to skip something, but everything was really relevant and uh, different areas. So, so thank you, thank you for for uh, being tonight with us here. And uh, we have Daniela Bojanić, um, who is a climate change expert. Daniela holds master degree in meteorology, 20 years of experience in the field of climate and climate change. Daniela was working for 15 years in the ministry in charge for environment and climate change, member of international bodies in the field uh, and the uh, UNFCCC focal point. She led the preparation of the long climate change currently in adoption procedure in Serbia. She initiated development of a low carbon development strategy that will present for the first time in Serbia potential options of development based on the cost Okay. <laughs> Currently engaged 
in the development of institutional structure and strategic, strategic framework for efficient use of the Green Climate Fund established under the UN FCC. Jacqueline Zinkovic, who is also a, a member of our network, but also soul and brain of uh, this uh, Congress, and the one very young perspective, the uh, woman who really inspires and motivates uh, many of us. And uh, uh, she's co founder and program manager of Green Economy Congress. He's, uh, Jacqueline is a political scientist by education and an ecofeminist by conviction. <laughs> she is working for a research organization named Group for Analysis and Creation of Public Policies, or ARCHI, where she performs the function of Vice President and Head of the Center for Sustainable Development. She writes analytical articles for the Green European Journal and works as a part-time journalist for several online media. and uh, Ankita Barbulov, the director of Resolta company in Serbia. Her, uh, Resolta is the, the most active and most successful as a company, not just in our country, but in the whole of the Balkan region. And uh, the company succeeded in developing a company led by Ankita, of course, as a, its a managing director, succeeded in developing a considerable number of projects in the country, paving the way and raising awareness about energy efficiency, public-private partnership, and ESCO model. And prior joining uh, GTE, which was the name of the company before rebranding, Ankitsa was the country director of Gorenia Project, uh, where she uh, where she spent several uh, years. Ten years she spent in consulting business for Chinese firms because she's. And um, uh, she holds a degree in Sinology okay, from the University of Belgrade. Ankita is a passionate advocate for sustainability and green energy. She is a reputed public speaker, holds MBA from Black School of Management, and she was one of the very few women who was. Uh, who was several weeks ago claiming the Danube River in parallel and even more devoted than the other men who came here. So she, she told me that, uh, what you did, you, you were claiming and uh, bringing uh, the bed, somebody, somebody left the bed on the bank of the river, so she was the one who cleaned the river for that huge and heavy, heavy, heavy bed with other, other, other ways as well. So she is really also inspiring all of us to not to be just professionally engaged, but to also go in the nature and see it where what and where we can we can make a change actually. And now let's start to have the discussion. Can we make a change in Serbia? I would like to start with Maya. Maya, we are all aware that the global energy sector is experiencing actually a tremendous challenge in transition to low carbon uh, economy and development. The EU Commission's clean energy package for all Europeans is very clear, is very clear in which direction it wants its countries to, to go. Uh, Serbia, including other countries from the region, since we are not members of the EU, but uh, we are contracting parties of the energy community, we also have some binding rules, which for new rules are not going to be fulfilled until the end of We have a prime minister saying that several days ago, but also we have a message from the Minister of Mining and Energy, and however, we are all aware of that. I would like to ask you the following What is necessary to be done? in order for renewables to become more representative of the country's energy mix. And is mainstreaming renewables in the uh, Serbia the direction we should actually follow? Firstly, thank you for the introduction. Nobody ever gave me such a long and you know, comprehensive introduction. Um, when we are now in the, trying to, to answer your, your your question. Um, when we say the energy transition today, it's actually 
it actually means we need to decarbonize our lifestyles and our economies. And uh, so renewables come as a solution to the problem. Um, we have two sectors that are basically causing the problems. One is energy advanced transport. Both of them, according to the clean energy package you referred to when you posed the question, uh, see power sector, electricity sector as a solution to the problem. So we see that in the growing number of electric cars transport. In the energy sector, this is a huge challenge for the countries such as Serbia who are traditionally leaning on lignite. So we have this logic of scarcity that has been embedded in, a, in our society where we have to shift to the logic of abundance because there is abundant resource that we are not using and uh, we have a lot of work to do to mainstream that, that issue because it, it, renewables are still perceived as uh, extremely costly and to some extent unnecessary for the country that is not contributed that much to the global harm, let me put it that way. But when we speak about numbers and the power sector, which is the main emitter of the greenhouse gases in Serbia, our power system as is, and it's uh, 30 million of CO2 per year. If you calculate that, it's like around 20 euros maybe carbon price. Yes. Oh, only 28. So you get a carbon burden of what? Uh, 30, yeah, it's... Uh, no, no, no. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's it's around one billion euros. It's uh, for the for the price of twenty, we get six hundred million a year. Yeah. So close to one billion euros is the carbon burden of the Serbian power sector as we speak. So uh, uh, Serbia is not in the EU yet. So this is why we have to think in advance because the process of the energy transition is already introduced in all the regulations coming from the, from, the, from the European Union and we do have uh, uh, obligations to transpose this uh, legislation in our national framework and this is happening. The, on the implementation side we are very much behind and um, we are not the only country that is behind but we are one of few that have uh, uh, inherited problems with uh, heavy production based on lignite. So this is the one thing that needs to be done for the, I don't think this is a thing for the decision makers only, I think this is, it has to do with the society. So how we actually approach this, this issue, because there are very few information you can read about how much uh, uh, the electricity we use, this lights run on electricity, so how much it costs one kilowatt hour used here. So, because we have hidden subsidies in the coal sector, so you are none of the citizen is really. You have to be really in the subject to understand what you're paying. And even if you understand, there are a lot of things that are not transparent. So you suggest the average number on your bill. You can't really tell what is subsidized behind. You do have a. Uh, you do have a, the the number for the renewables that according to the new legislation needs to be displayed on the bill. And this is still very low, this is not something that is of concern and we expect a less than 5% increase to happen on the end user billing because of the, of the heavy investments in the wind power we had uh, during the last two years. But this is, not, um, this is not something that should give us too much hope. Why? Because this is the ending of the process that started 10 years ago. So we see a lot of things happening today, but this is something that people have been working on since uh, 2005, 2006. There was huge lagging in the legislation, in the, not the laws, because Serbia is very uh, quick in, in transposing the, 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 the directives coming from the energy community in, in, the, the, in Brussels, but we are not so good in, in the implementation. Uh, of, uh, of, of those rules. This is why we had always had lagging of the bylaws. And with, without bylaws, you can't you can't really uh, use the, 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 the regulatory framework to the full extent. So, um, um, energy transition is a very important topic 
because first of all, a lot of us, and I believe also the majority in this room, would connect that to high costs. So this is something that is expensive. And it does come at a cost, like everything in your life. So uh, if you want to have clean air, if you want to have sustainable energy future, if you want to change completely to decarbonize economy, it has to come at a cost. The thing is, it pays off. And then, you know, it's the core concept of sustainability is that we don't leave the bills to our children and future generations, which is exactly what we are doing right now. So if we are not resolving the problem today, we are just leaving that for the future generation to pay our bills. And this is just, it's just not the right thing. To, there's not, I don't have to elaborate on that. It's just the wrong thing to do. So even, you don't have to be parents to understand it's, it's not the proper thing to do. So uh, mainstreaming, it's, uh, we need a lot of uh, initiatives. Hopefully WISE can be very uh, active because women are, because we are, uh, we have concern for our offspring and we are very good with, uh, with uh, communicating this sustainability as a major, major uh, principle that needs to be, you know, uh, embedded in the, in, the, in, the very, in the very hard industry such as energy. Where, which is dominantly led by men, media, middle-aged men. Uh, so uh, uh, I view wise can be one of the game changers, but uh, also a lot of bottom-up initiatives because I don't think public really knows a lot. I mean, I can really talk a lot about that, so I'm going to leave maybe time for the others. But the first message I wanted to pass to all of you is that we need a we need to acquire additional knowledge and information on the choices we make. So, and I, it's, I'm basically addressing the general public. Of course, the decision makers, they are supposed to make decisions for us, but also the experts community and academics who are a bit on the margins and they are still in those ivory towers, so we need to, to make them come out and, and you know, pass the knowledge to uh, and we need this topic to be given more, more weight, not only in the, in, the, in the light of the international obligations that you mentioned. Because this is irreversible. One energy transition starts, you can't go back. You're just on the, it's like you're, get, you're going to get on a train and then uh, uh, if you're on the right train, you, you, there's nothing to worry. If the train is wrong, every station will be wrong. One says, okay, climate change is real, but um, we're just not convinced uh, it is caused by humans, and it's also very wrong. The third one said, oops, and the fourth one says, fuck. And uh, compared to the duration of the fall graph, we see that the first two are rather long and uh, there, there is enough time to, to make a change. But oops is very short, and the fuck is not to be discussed, actually. So my question for you is, do you believe we are still in phase two? Okay, climate change is real, we are just not convincing it is caused by humans. Or we are still in the phase, oops. Well, maybe I'm not the right person, because I don't want to, to I don't wish to believe in, in any of these two choices, you know, so even with the graph. And everything else, uh, I, I really think that the largest portion of the community, international community, uh, understand that uh, the climate change is real and that it's caused by humans. Uh, because I really believe that uh, all of us who, who finished at least primary school need to understand. So and I really believe that there are a lot of people in, in the world who finished primary school. And sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm not sure in Serbia is that which which should happen or not. Uh, so so 
you know, all these issues and all these activities that uh, are, has been happening uh, in some previous years, including the Energy Community Treaty, including this, uh, uh, which, uh, which I mentioned when it comes to, to um, low carbon uh, and climate resilient development. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, are the result of understanding that you know uh, climate change is happening. So even you know without it just came to my mind. Even without the primary school, you know, when when you are in the age of one, for example, it's obvious that climate change is happening. You know, so the, the weather conditions are not the same like like it used to be. Uh, so, so um, I really think that, that people understand. I really think, and I'm quite convinced that there are different lobbies and uh, you know different interests that uh, try to move the things uh, from the right direction and from the point to some another uh, uh, less important issues and points. So, like for example, let's. Uh, to afforestation and reforestation because in that sense we are going to in that case we are going to speak about trees not about the coal uh, or uh, let's speak at all about you know uh, 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 are the climate changes something which happen or not and uh, which are the reasons because that is a matter of fact put us in a debate are climate change really happening or not, and not to deal with things, you know. Uh, but which I think, you know, just, sorry, uh, I know that I'm going to take your role now, uh, sometimes it ha it's happened. I need just to mention something, as a matter of fact, to add uh, uh, and uh, uh, to comment on something which, which uh, uh, Maya mentioned, and with this uh, uh, renewables and uh, um, climate resilient, low, low carbon development and uh, the, the uh, underlying all the time that those activities are costly and the people think that uh, those activities and this change of direction is costly. Uh, I'm sure that this happened because you know there are two uh, many uh, uh, events and too many occasions in which people mention that, especially the people who are responsible for uh, uh, policy planning or uh, are really responsible to do the things, mention that some of those activities are quite quite expensive. And every time, time when you're listening about the environment and climate change, uh, or really often, you could hear that those will be costly for us. Uh, to be honest, for me, uh, current, for example, uh, electricity price is quite costly for me. You know, because uh, for me, something is costly when I compare my salary and the price which I pay for my flat and for electricity. And when you know, make when I make such kind of uh, calculation, and then if I make, you know, just just really. Easiest calculation, for example, for Germany with uh, some uh, average uh, salary and average uh, 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 bill for electricity, we came to the fact that even with these hidden subsidies, we do not pay cheap electricity. So, you know, the fact is that, that uh, and I, I really think that the most of these this things could be, and this, you know, different opinion and different perception. Uh, who is, uh, as a matter of fact, or which is the, the reason for the climate change could, could be uh, solved with uh, deep and detailed cost benefit analysis. Because, you know, usually uh, we are working, especially in the region, uh, with this cost, real, real cost benefit analysis that is going to show you know, the expenses and that is going to, to, to show benefits and not only the benefits in a sense of you're going to be uh, uh, healthier, but you know these benefits, you know, in the figures. Um, the most, the most of this, these things could could uh, could be sold. So, in general, I, I even don't want you know to discuss uh, our climate change that really happened or not. So it's obvious it's happened. Uh, it doesn't. Uh, it's not important anymore uh, who believes that, who and which are the, the real reasons, 
because there are too many uh, uh, really scientific and practical uh, examples and, and, uh, and uh, uh, conclusions who proves and who, what, which are the reasons for, for these changes. So I don't really think that we should uh, just discuss uh, uh, what and how we should start uh, with concrete actions, especially especially in the region, because it seems to me that uh, that uh, there is a lot of, there is a lot of, of these actions, and which also needs to, to be mentioned. You know that uh, it's not just uh, uh, well, this low carbon development is not just uh, uh, environment issue. It's also uh, and I'm completely sure that. Um, issue of, of further selling the products and uh, you know this international uh, markets and such things because I'm quite confident that if we do not do not in, uh, uh, in all sectors we will have a problem you know to, to go and to sell our, our products whatever those are. Okay. I, mean, I, mean, I say everything. For now. Okay. I noticed on social media that you were traveling a lot during the last couple of months. You were in many countries, uh, you were wise, and you, I, I suppose that you got some very useful insights about the way the economy in Europe is uh, developing. And I would like to ask you actually to, to give us a review of uh, compared to the trends in Europe, what's the position of development in Serbia, what has been done so far, and uh, what is to be done in the future? Yeah, uh, it's really a perfect question. <laughs> yeah, but I will try to be short so we don't have a lot of questions and we don't have enough time, and I hope that we'll also have a discussion with the participants. Uh, I am uh, in, in the green issues for six years now, uh, and I work for the political, uh, in the political area in Serbia and in EU with the European Party for three years. Uh, and I worked a lot uh, on the environmental issues. And it was really frustrating because, as Daniela said, it's always, it's always, we always end up uh, on the money. Uh, like we, always, uh, we always end up uh, on the story that we don't have enough money for environmental protection. And I am a person who uh, seeks solutions to that problem. So I decided to work uh, on the green economy issues and to explain to the people, uh, especially young people, because they understand the best, new trends that uh, we can also have sustainable businesses uh, that earn money uh, that you can uh, employ yourself and your colleagues uh, and also protect the environment. And I had this fortune that I cooperated a lot with uh, different green parties from the Europe and I could see that uh, it's not uh, it's, it's not that different that uh, we don't have the knowledge. We have the knowledge that was also in the past. Uh, but uh, we don't have the system and we don't have uh, also like we don't have I, um, I cannot remember the word but uh, we are not confident enough yeah that, that is the word uh, we don't fight for, for our ideas, ideas uh, and the other side is much louder, much stronger they they have the confidence even uh, if they don't have the arguments. So, uh, on the general level, that is the case. Uh, and then, uh, we worked on a regional, uh, a regional research about green economy in Serbia, uh, Bulgaria, and Macedonia, and tried to see uh, what are the trends and to find some recommendations uh, for improving uh, the conditions. Uh, and it's really positive. We have lots of young startup companies. We have uh, big companies that are understanding 
that they need to change, that they need to adapt. For now, it's uh, on the level of co corporate and social responsibility, uh, but more and more uh, it goes also to the production processes and those kind of stuff. So, being able to have a really positive trend, and I'm very positive. Uh, as I said uh, this morning uh, at the opening of the Congress, last year we had two days of Congress, and this year we have three days. And we didn't manage to put everything that we wanted to put in it because there are so many different good initiatives here. Uh, I know that that is the answer to your question. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good start. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, I'm uh, for you uh, question. Since I met you, actually, you've been going all over Serbia trying to promote the topic of um, energy efficiency and uh, public private partnership. You've been communicating with uh, various sectors, including uh, decision makers at the national level, the local level, businesses, uh, and you. You're actually the right person to ask what you identify as a major, major challenge when it comes to energy efficiency, which is also important if we're thinking about sustainable energy development. What are the major challenges you, you actually well, encounter? As you know, and uh, everybody who has ever listened to me talk on any conference have heard a lot about me complaining about the challenges and obstacles. And uh, throughout this, uh, I know, four years of uh, fight to bring the good and the energy efficiency and the environmental positive impact to the society for almost no cost with the business model that we offer, where we invest everything and they simply enjoy the savings in green gas, uh, energy for the money and it wasn't going to be all that well. Uh, I've stopped or I've decided to stop to talk about the challenges or just to line up the obstacles that I meet every day and I started you know thinking more deeply about what are actually the root causes so why are not things uh, getting better at a pace that all of us who are sitting here would expect them to be normal. To, to get better and to get better at the pace that we would wish them to see. Well, uh, then, then I'd say, uh, out of all the thinking, there are two root causes, or like a root cause with two sides. One is uh, the side of an individual, each of us living here in this country, and the other comes from the system. When we speak about the, about the individuals, uh, there are three reasons to the problem. The first and foremost is the lack of knowledge, lack of education. Definitely, people did not finish the primary school about the environmental issues. Definitely, because of that, they don't have the appropriate level of awareness and consciousness of all the harm that we are doing each day when we grab three plastic bags instead of none when we buy things. And uh, as the third reason for the issue that comes out the not proper education about the environment is the lack of the responsibility and self-responsibility within most of the individuals that surround us. That problem or those problems are definitely being spilled over to the system because the system and the state is actually made up of the people that we meet on the street. They're fighting to get as many plastic bags as they can. And therefore even there, within the system, we like to think definitely first is the carrot. People are, are not being stimulated to not be fighting for plastic bags, etc., to improve their energy efficiency, etc., etc. And then on the other hand, they're not being punished if they don't do so. So I end up in my building, which has no insulation at all, fighting with everybody, 
in trying to explain and end up being crazy why I strive for getting an insulation and new facade is our building. These people, people do not understand that it's going to be better for their wallets, that it's going to be better for their environment, and it's in the end going to be better for them, their kids, and their health. And then there are the root causes of all the obstacles and challenges that I actually do meet when I go around and try to sell the story about the need to implement energy efficiency and we will give away for free whatever that we are trying to implement at them. Serbia. 
So I mean, we are very uh, exposed to the volatility of the gas prices. This is absolutely not the option for Serbia. We will be obliged to close our lignite thermal power plant which are close to 4,000 megawatts, but like 50% of what we have on one. And what do we have then? Like, so we have some renewables. When we speak about renewables, everybody thinks we need solar. Basically, in the policy talks, you don't really hear a lot of biomass and hydro, I have to be frank with you, in any institution. So everybody thinks of really cheap intermittent power. It is costly at the beginning, but once it pays off, it becomes the technology with the lowest marginal costs. So that comes to fuel number two after Ankitsa, it's me with wind and solar on the second place. Only after that, we start thinking about others. Um, wind and solar have a lot of challenges in the, you know, with the, how to integrate them. And this, this is a, separate subjects, so just going to skip it now because it's, it's probably too much at this point. But then what we have left, we have some, whenever you hear, you hear a strategy for Serbia, you have a statistics for biomass, that Serbia is biomass, yeah. So a lot of that biomass is not, uh, that is used, it's not even in the balances because it's used in the households. We have a, it's not in any balance, state balance that you can actually um, uh, that you can actually see, and it's used in the most in the efficient way. They burn it in the stoves, and they, they, you know, also uh, harm the environmental health, health of the of the housewives for you know working on those smederevas. You know, like, you know, this is, this is making enormous numbers. Really, the numbers that make impact on the whole strategy of the of the of the energy sector of Serbia. So, because you have just to go out outside of uh, Belgrade, and you will see how many towns basically lean on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the wood chip, on the on the wood. So this is a completely separate issue that has been always connected with the heating only. But there are technologies that allow the usage of the biomass for production of power, and we see that in the, so we see this conversion. We see that in Scandinavia, we see in Poland. Poland has a lot of problems with coal, so everybody is looking at Poland, who is already new, what they will do with their 33 gigawatts of coal power plants, which is huge. So, uh, biomass is a specific issue. And I left hydro for the end, so what's the problem? I am, as the, somebody coming from the energy sector, I cannot neglect any source. Just you know, and, and, and uh, you know, lay, label it toxic because of the problems that uh, happened in the sector with some investors. We are not that rich to neglect the whole source. So I'm not against hydropower, I have to tell you, but it should not be built at the expense of the environmental and social harm. Yeah. And the second thing, I can tell you that probably some of my colleagues wouldn't like it, but there are some, uh, um, and I'm one of them, there are opinions that uh, the gains you get from small hydro cannot justify the environmental harm they do. But I'm speaking small for large hydro, so we need large hydro. So we should not just, you know, not look at the whole set. It's very difficult today, I would be surprised to find that it's easier to finance coal power plant than hydro. We are speaking about banks and well, we have this EPRD now saying, oh, no, we're not going to find this coal anymore, uh, fossil fuels. But it happened just last month, you know, last year it was not the case. And we still have to see that it's going to happen, as they say. So we have a lot of banks, you asked me about mainstreaming the technology. This is, there's so many things, so I kind of forget to say everything at, uh, at the right time, but ultimately I, I remember. So. Uh, we have a problem with development banks, probably. They are partners of the, of the country, and they can really influence what will the strategy be. We are speaking about European investment banks, EPRD, the World Bank. They are big investors in the infrastructure and the energy sector. But if the European Development Bank, one of them, I'm not going to name which one, even though it's publicly available, so you can find it on the Energy Community website, they lend money 
to the coal mines in Serbia. And then they get state guarantees for the loan. And then another European institution takes the infringement procedure against Serbia because, of, because Serbia issued the state guarantee as a security for the form. So it's, it's a kind of chicken and egg situation. So it's, it, there's a lot of hypocrisy. That is why I'm saying there's a lot of a, there's a lot of work to do to mainstream the renewables, and it's happening in, in some other. There are very there are very good examples in Europe, so we can do a lot of the uh, benchmarking and maybe you know cooperation to, to, to show it, it it really happens. And uh, another thing we had uh, in Bosnia, for example. So the the German the, the KfW is lending money to uh, only to utilities. Okay, for wind parks, not for the coal. But still, they don't lend money unless they get a state guarantee. This is just not a level playing field. They need to even the, the conditions for everybody. Otherwise, there will always be utilities who they're still dominant, they're incumbent companies. We don't have new players on the market, and this is actually the first transition. Why we are not ready for this transition, we didn't finish the first one where we were supposed to open the market. And this will, uh, this will be do, uh, be happen at the very benefit of the consumers. Because if you have competition, it's just like in other sectors, if you will drive prices down. And uh, you will force utilities to not to have subsidies and cross subsidies and not to have uh, 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 I mean to, to think more about the, 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 the price sensitivity of the of the economy that is already pretty weak. So to end up, my strategy would be I'm uh, the first, I'm second, and then we can talk about biomass and high ground. Yeah. I like this about the strategy. Um, Daniela, I want you to make a comment, uh, uh, but I will ask you a question which I can't plan, but you can, of course. Uh, uh, what are actually the three biggest challenges uh, in Serbia as when it comes to climate change? It's going to be easier to say about the challenges in Serbia. Uh, so I, I need, uh, because you know, I, I came uh, from the, I used to work for the Ministry in charge for the environment and there are a lot of uh, um, fighting about small hydro those days when it comes to, to, to this ministry. And I need to mention, you know, something, there is something which uh, calls environmental input assessment. So in compliance with this, which which uh, Maya mentioned, you know, there is no need for any kind of public events and supports of different uh, faculties and their professors to do the job. Ministry in charge for environment has the tool to do the job. He has environmental input assessment. So without environmental input assessment approval, nobody cannot build. And Ministry in charge for construction cannot issue the permit. So it's quite easy. It's really quite easy. It's not uh, a nuclear science at all. So, uh, uh, which I also need to mention uh, as someone who, who is not from energy sector, but uh, it's more to climate change, uh, when it comes to hydro, uh, which is also quite important, uh, especially when it comes to large hydro. Uh, there is obvious certain huge impact of climate change on the water resources. So it's completely, I almost say stupid, uh, it's completely unsustainable to uh, develop strategy and to see as a, a rescue plan uh, how to, to escape, you know, from, from coal and to go to, to water resources if there, there is no really deep analysis of impact of climate change on water resources. Because otherwise we are going to have again, you know, some investments that are, will not be sustainable. That's it, you know. We could like that or not. And we could repeat it even in a water management strategy that Serbia is a rich by water. That's not a fact. That's not a fact. When you look in average, you know, the figures are the same like used to be. 
but it's not on the average because you know you have a quite long season with a lack of water resources. So that is a matter of fact, and these changes also makes a lot of problems when it comes to already built small hydropower plants. Because you know, somebody didn't go in details when it comes to environmental impact assessment, and environmental impact assessments at the same time do not include, doesn't include climate change scenarios. So that's it, you know. Like I said, it's quite, it's quite, quite uh, easy. When it comes to these three challenges, you know, uh, uh, the first one from the perspective of, of climate change is also this efficiency, you know. I don't know why that is so huge, huge, huge uh, problem. Uh, it's the lack of money, of course, again, or it's, that is a good excuse, right? We have to, it's a good excuse to do nothing. That is, that is an amazing thing. Uh, and I'm quite confident, you know, that there is a, uh, there are a lot of uh, different budget, uh, budgetary and other resources that could be, you know, uh, uh, used for these purposes. And again, we came, you know, uh, to, to, to legal system and system in general. Because, you know, we cannot rely on uh, someone's understanding of the issue. I'm quite confident that all people finish primary school, but uh, 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 with a lack of, you know, uh, uh, pushing the thing we forgot, we, or we are for, for, uh, forgetting. So, uh, that is the first issue, energy efficiency, because you know that uh, could bring us to huge reduction of GNG emission reduction. There is certain analysis when it comes, for example, for uh, uh, two old buildings uh, in uh, Belgrade that, you know, uh, a, a huge, really huge reduction could be achieved through, through uh, energy efficiency improvement. Uh, secondly, uh, I really think that it's uh, quite important and the huge challenge is how to explain to people and engineers and uh, policy developers that climate change is not the issue that belongs to one ministry, ministry in charge for the environment. It's a multi-sectoral issue. Every ministry and every climate, every, every document, especially strategic uh, and, and development, uh, documents need to involve climate change issues in it. So the, the, I think that it was mentioned, you know, but I, I will check, uh, I will read as a matter of fact, this urban development strategy, for example, uh, that it includes climate change, but somehow, you know, when you pass through different documents, including this energy strategy we, we were mentioning, uh, there is a climate change uh, uh, chapter, but it's more on, um, you know, like fat field. Uh, descriptive and you know we should do the good thing so that's not involvement and inclusion of climate change into development goals it's just fulfilling the obligation or expectation of UN and European Union so it's completely wrong uh, and uh, yeah I think that, that as another and the third, third issue is how to understand that we cannot uh, 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 think about GHG emission reduction as a one pillar and adaptation or vulnerability uh, reduction as a second pillar. Because again, it's quite easy, you know, uh, and good example could be this, this uh, hydropower. So we cannot rely and to think how to redu reduce GHG emission uh, emissions using hydro if we do not think uh, about the vulnerability of hydro sector. So it seems to me that those are the, the three major major uh, challenges. I agree with you, but uh, you know, there are some studies which are being done in our region. There is a very good study by UNECE about nexus water, climate, agriculture, where it is clearly stated that when planning the development of hydro power sector, we should take into consideration the fact that there will be less water not just for hydro, but for cooling thermal power plants as well, you know. So it's something that there should be somebody who should read that, actually. You know? so, because the material is here, you know, and we have it. Okay, Jacqueline, uh, do you want to say something about um, uh, renewables in Serbia in terms of what is sustainable and what is not? Or you would like to, to present us with some interesting example of green economy, which you'll find uh, we had several examples today, which also showed the video that you made, uh, and there are a lot of, a lot of good examples, uh, but when we talk about green economy or renewable
renewable energy or sustainable energy. I really want to stress that uh, green economy is a holistic concept and it's not only about environmental issues, it's also about social issues and it's not enough uh, I don't know if Eva is here, I always quote uh, her uh, when I explain this. Uh, it's not enough to have a factory of, uh, I don't know, uh, wind turbines uh, and to have workers that, are, that you pay less than it's sustainable. Uh, they, they, they work seven days a week. Uh, that uh, management is all men. And uh, so it's a really a holistic, green economy is really a holistic concept that implies not only environment but also the social component. And we really need to be careful with that when we speak about renewable energy. And I think the problem with uh, small hydro plants, uh, hydro plants in Serbia, are really the ducks from that, that we have these projects of renewable energy. Uh, without any consultations with the citizens that live here, uh, nobody asks them what do they want, what do they need, uh, and also our policies are completely based uh, on uh, outdated data. We don't have real data uh, where we could build real uh, and sustainable policies, and we talked today about that on our first panel. Uh, and our organization is really, really struggling with that to have policies that are based on uh, sustainable information and to follow them through uh, also implementation. Uh, yeah, but coming back to the examples of the real green economy in Serbia, it's mostly small and medium enterprises. Uh, they are always connected also with the social inter, inter, uh, social entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's really hard really for me. Uh, and uh, also they are, they are often connected with the science and innovations. So they are uh, at a phase uh, that they really need support to be developed. And in this market that exists now in Serbia and in the region. Uh, it's really hard for them to work and to, they, they, have, they always have a good start uh, but it's hard for them to develop and to survive in this market uh, that supports uh, large multinational companies. So we identified several problems like uh, they are really burdened with a lot of parafiscal charges, uh, they can't get finance, uh, they cannot get subsidies, they cannot get loans from the banks because the conditions are the same as, as the conditions for the big companies. Uh, and also, uh, they are having difficulties uh, in charging their uh, work. And what, what you could see is that the state is the biggest uh, debtor to small and medium enterprises in Serbia. So uh, we really need to work on that to have these really great uh, companies survive. And I just want to mention a few. We, we saw them in the video yes, uh, this morning. Uh, there is really this impressive uh, social enterprise in Ujice. Uh It's called uh, Women's Center, Ujice. Uh, and these women uh, are uh, from the vulnerable groups, they are all the women who cannot find work or they are single moms. Uh, and they start to collect textile and recycle it and uh, they produce bags and di different kinds of materials. So this is really a good example of circular economy and also a social aspect. Also, uh, Ivanka from Ecofundi, she was a guest on this panel last year. Yeah, she's really this great, dedicated woman and, uh, and she started the uh, uh, innovation that she's uh, producing mushrooms from a base uh, coffee mist. So it's also a great example. And also, I'm uh, looking to Christina and Anna, there is this Soladro uh, from Serbia, uh, these guys who, I'm not saying it's connected with you, but I'm looking at you because you're dealing with waste management. Uh, so, uh, these guys are creating uh, this mechanical press for recycling uh, cans. So, those are just a few that I wanted to mention.
mentioned, there are really many, many examples, but we really need to support them and to advocate for better conditions for their businesses. Thank you for, just for sharing those great examples with us. We are also enjoyed when we were preparing this video to, to present. And uh, uh, you mentioned uh, financing as a problem for, for young, uh, small, medium companies and startups. But also, my impression is that there is a huge problem with financing the energy efficiency sector. Though, uh, including IFI, as my, you mentioned, uh, and both commercial banks are strongly promoting uh, their green portfolio, uh, I'm not sure that they're very honest and what they're offering to the market is uh, not according to the possibilities of our, our I would say, of the ones who should borrow. If we're not talking about big multinational companies or big investors, but if you're talking about uh, domestic companies, or if you're talking about uh, ordinary people, citizens, who should improve, for example, energy efficiency in their homes. So do you think that uh, for the time being, they, they have been having this win-win approach, or that some improvements should be definitely um, put on agenda for some coming period when it comes to financing of projects? Well, <clears throat> when it comes to banks, I'd say they're in a state of like, uh, be careful what you wish for because it might happen to you. <laughs> when they advertise themselves and the services they offer, they always say that they have a very good credit lines products, financing products uh, for the energy efficiency, uh, be it single households, so all the companies or the uh, public institutions. And the other thing that uh, I would like to say about the financial institutions here is that we, for example, as a company or the other as a companies uh, or the market are running faster than they are, even though they are promoting themselves as uh, many of them as leaders in the energy efficiency sector. The reality when you approach the banks is that they are always uh, asking for very high collaterals. They are always uh, asking, actually imposing the all same conditions to either an individual uh, public institution or the multinational corporation. Uh, they still don't understand what the project financing is. Uh, they're always asking uh, for more of the back-to-back -back guarantees uh, when it comes to us and our company, which has been working in this market for almost four years and has a certain portfolio of projects here, it's still not enough for them. They're always seeking for the uh, mother companies, guarantees, etc., etc. And when it comes to the, for example, individual households or the residential sectors, uh, the residential buildings, which are one of the biggest consumers of the energy in Serbia, it's uh, even worse. Uh, I've tried to talk uh, to one of those IFCs that have been promoting the credit lines for the residential sector recently on a very high level conference, etc. Two days after they promoted this package and this conference, and they simply said that they're not ready to come out and talk to us. Then at that moment, I was representing my own building and we tried to you know, raise a loan for it. So in reality, it's not as, as, uh, as nice as uh, they're saying when they're promoting their etc. I've even had uh, the experience of uh, meeting a bank officer at the conferences that we were attending together all the time where he would be promoting the green packages of them to both companies and individual households and then I approached him once and went for a very serious meeting in the name of our company to, to talk about several projects that we have in municipalities and private companies as well, and then he said that even after a year of public appearance on each and every conference, they don't, don't actually have the line to find in the energy efficiency, that they have had it once, and most probably they're going to have it next spring again. It's been three years ago, and we've tried again a couple of months ago, and it still doesn't work. 
So, hmm? the next three moves probably. So that is the actual situation. We have uh, signed more than eight million euros of uh, projects which we were financing here in Serbia, and every time it was really a struggle. The first time the condition just to you know call our sky for you. The, the condition was such that we had signed a contract for 15 years to be delivering the heat to four public schools schools in the public sector in one city, a very good standing city by the way. So 15 years to get back what you have invested in a year zero. So they gave us uh, a credit alone to be paid back in five years. So all of the profits we're going to make, we're making, and even more, we're supposed to give to them during the first five years. The next project that we've had is one of the biggest projects uh, in Serbia in energy efficiency. It's again a PPP project worth about 3 million euros. So we have prepared ourselves as a company to put as an equity around 30%, which would be the average according to our experience in the region and previously in Serbia. But then it was not 30, but 40 percent, which they expected. And even after we have put down the 40 percent of equity, it was not enough for them to give us the rest of the money in sequences, as we would be, you know, implementing the project. But then they have put the request on us to finance in total, so to unexpectedly put the 100 percent of all those premium and new euros planned. And only after that, and after it was proved that the system is functional, and by the way, is the LED lighting system. There is no simpler one at the moment. So after we would prove that it's functioning, then they would, and they have, in the end, have paid us those 60%. Plus, the, the, the interest rates are, I may say, still outrageously high compared to the EU countries. It's above 4 percent with all the collectors. So I'd really say that they're running a lot slower than they should. Thank you, Ankita. Um, I want to say that uh, the same man officer approached us and our portal at the time to prepare some promotional marketing communication offer and they were really working hard. And then when they did not respond, you know, once they received it, I said, I will give up, you know, it's my risk to spend at that time. And I was talking about this uh, with Angita several days ago. I said, oh, we should communicate more often, you know, because we could identify actually who is serious on the market and who is not, you know. So um, I hope that you enjoyed and uh, it is inspiring speeches of uh, our wise uh, women. Uh, we are a bit late, but uh, I would like to ask you to, to, you're free to ask a question if you have any. And, uh, I'm sure they would be delighted to answer. Just uh, say your name and uh, where are you coming from? Yeah. Uh, my name is Dara. Sorry for my English. It's not that good, but I think that you can understand me. Uh, just not finish with uh, this conference like politici politicals. Uh, you said about uh, many higher plans. Yes, but it's not possible to build because, uh, you know, uh, that energy is really small, but they are doing that. They are doing that and they are doing it at uh, a uh, protected area also. Just, I know that you feel also, I hope that you feel bad also about that. And you're looking at me, of course. No, no, no. <laughs> Everybody who is, uh, you know, human. Yeah, so we, we don't represent the government. So, but this is, uh, as Daniela said, there is a, there are some investors who deal respect the rules. This is how we see that. So, for this is, yeah, this is, I would absolutely agree with Daniela. This is much more simpler than we think. There's not no big deal about that. They just didn't respect the rule. They were not supposed to build that. It's a full stop. So this is a, this is the, the the country needs to, to the, the government needs to take actions and to stop that. So for me, this is a very simple question. More difficult is the one I was referring to that we will lack resources. So I don't see small hydro 
as a, as a portion in that. We are really speaking, this is why I said the harm they do is too much compared to, even in the, you know, so let me, let me be, you know, politically correct. So imagine you have small, there are small hydroelectric built in the areas which are okay, so there are no environmental impacts and, you know, there are no issues with the jeopardizing the, the, the social, uh, you know, the living of the people, of the people, so, so even then, even then, even that, that's such a small portion of an energy, so the benefit, it really contributes to Serbia in terms of decarbonizing, is very small compared to all the risks you have on the other side. This was my point. So the question you raised, absolutely right. But the, 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 just to clarify this, because the thing, of the, I, I feel I have to clarify about resources. Imagine we do nothing. Like, we don't do any hydro, we don't manage to employ lots of biomass, this would have to follow a lot of forestry plantations. So we can do some small, the, the country has put a cap on solar, uh, also on wind, but we will have some wind, you'll see wind turbines coming on, a, you can see them being built. But this is still below 10%. This is still below 10%, yeah, where we would be, I'm speaking very roughly. We will all probably have to uh, not close all four gigawatts of thermal, but portion of that will be refurbished, so the trees will be very costly because they need to invest heavily. I think 1.5 billion euros is only to invest in their sulfurization. And this is the only, not only problem with the environment. It's not only the content of sulfur. We have other, other, other issues as well. So the electricity will be just too expensive, so it will be cheaper to get wind and solar than, believe it or not, it's coming in maybe next year, if they might be here, we'll, I can already show you, it's we are the grid parity, it works. So we are right there. But the thing with resources, if the country does nothing to deploy more renewables, we will end up as importers, which I'm quite liberal, so I, I can live with that. I think there's a lot of potential in the market that has not been exploited because we have a, a burden that we like, to, and it has to do with the national security, the energy security, the geopolitics. So we kind of want to be sufficient ourselves without having to depend on neighbors, okay? That's fair, it's, it's okay. And every high government official would tell you the same, it makes sense. If I would know being liberal, if I would think that we can import cheap electricity from Bulgaria and Romania, I would be fine with that. The problem I have is that if we do nothing and we become heavy, heavy importers, we will import in future. So we will still be alive when that happens. So we are not speaking for our future. We will be importing cheap electricity from the countries that produce them in the nuclear power plants. And this is just not right. This is also not sustainable. So we have a, just, a, you may remember this, so I'm still two more minutes. There are a lot, you probably, do because we have our own problems, so we are not really informed of that, but there are huge negotiations with France and Germany. Why? France doesn't have coil. It's the biggest nuclear producer in, in Europe, and, and one of the top worldwide. Okay, so France is all about the okay? Whereas Germany, as the most uh, conscious nation, they uh, closed all the nuclear power plants, and now they are have, they're trying to, there are uh, uh, different groups, so you have obviously the industry interests, the big companies, RWE, and so on, who have large uh, fossil fuel power plants, so they don't want to close it today or tomorrow, the latest possible, obviously. But then the country, the citizens are very, uh, have very, uh, are very, have very uh, high levels of awareness and conscience. So they're actually forcing them politically. So the green movement is very strong in Germany. So what they are trying to build is the plan to close some coal, okay, uh, uh, fossil fuel. And if they do a lot of that in a short period of time, they will have to import electricity. Where? From France, from those nuclear power plants. And this is just not. It's, it's the same thing, it's just not fair that one country does everything right and that because nuclear is not recognized as a contributor to the climate change, they don't have it CO2, they have, it has other issues, so that, you know, it's, a, it's another topic. 
it's, I'm trying to tell the equation is very, it has a lot of variables. So the story about resources is that it's a big story. And probably the, somebody in the government, this or the next, or I don't know when it will be the top priority, needs to do the math and also needs to be able to have the vision and make bold decisions because they have to be bold. You have to tell people, okay, we don't have to do the nuclear, these are our options. We can do this or this or this, and these are the costs the society will pay. And for small hydro, of course you're right. But this is for me very simple. Those who don't respect rules, they should not be granted any permits to build. And this is outrageous what they're doing in the national park. Yeah. But there is, for example, in Bosnia, you have bigger color power plants, which can be very good for us to balance our wings if we do it on the balanced in regional markets. So they are, you have to look at it more wide, you know, for. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I answered that. Uh, I think that you did, but uh, I, I would say that the government should be right. You know. And you have to be compliant with that. Otherwise, the plant will not get operational permits and it will, be, it will never come to operation, uh, to operational life. But we are yet to see if our officials have uh, set this red line of the standards. In, uh, this is very, uh, it's, it's a big story, it has to do with uh, carbon credits and a lot of regulation in that regard. Serbia is not part of the EU, so these are not applied to us. But by the time the the plant is built, it's like 10 years. Everything you do in energy is a very inert sector. It takes 10 years. You cannot do quick fix. If you may make a mistake, it's going to take you 10 to 15 years to fix it. So you can't do quick fix in, in, in the energy sector. So by the time it's built, we are we supposed to be part of the EU. So all the rules just going to, from the day one, apply. So what would be wise to do is to, to start planning so that once it's once you are there you're fully compliant. Otherwise there's no way it can actually operate work in cell power. So that's the so each it's nothing is like uh, I am this is my my position. No technology is toxic per se. There are pros and cons. And then you have to calculate the impact. And you see if it's worth, like in life, when you, 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 if you want to go out, if you're a girl, you do the cost-benefit analysis, if it's worth going out, I have to put makeup, and I have to, you know, uh, dress up, and, you know, you know, and then, uh, you know, so you, it's, you calculate if it's worth, you're not doing all of that. Yeah, it's the guy worth it. Yeah, it's the guy worth it. And then you have to remove everything else. I mean, it's like in life. So you, the, the thing is, if you're a decision maker and you really make bold decisions for the country, for all of us, no, we, nobody asks us. This is the thing. So we are not, nobody, you know, we have to have our own initiative, likewise, to have a voice, to say, to be, you know, stubborn and annoying, you know, and pop up everywhere and talk about, you know, what we think, what we believe is right. But nobody asks us to take part of that, you know, it's just they take decisions for us. And those are not easy to see if it's for our kids as well. So, because uh, toilets basically can be good, but it's going to be very costly. I don't see how it works viable economically if they fulfill all the standards. If not, it's like a, it's like a, again, we're doing very it's costly. against the law. It's like the it's the criminal. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but it shouldn't be because the they are, the regulation is very strict, and if you are not compliant you won't get operational permit. It doesn't apply to the civilian plants today, all of them, but some of them are already in this regime uh, where they're given a certain amount of thermal power plants, a certain amount of hours of operation, and after that they just need to close down. So it's like phasing out. So it's not that we are really uh, on the margin. We are still in some of those processes, and it's coming, yeah. OK, my, uh, now I realize, uh, because uh, we're well uh, about one hour, that we should organize a different conference <laughs> to discuss in more details. I would say, uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention, uh, to say that, um, Jolena, there is one more question. Mm -hmm.
It's not a question. Actually, I want to say something. Okay, I'm uh, Sasha Matic. My English is so bad. I'm from Kragovac. I'm biologist and ecologist. So I see the is here in this room no many uh, ecologists and biologists. And I must say one thing, but I see uh, in your talking. Uh, you making one mistake uh, when we talking of climate changes. Uh, the climate changes uh, it's not something what we built. It's built when the earth began. The problem is the people, and uh, now the fact that it's too much people, too much impact, too much uh, pollution, and other things. In fact to rapidly move in the climate change. So it's very, I think, sorry, it's my opinion, it's very important to tell others it's not something what we doing, the climate change is something normal, but we directly hit to rapidly change and we, of course, uh, have influence of uh, thank you for your remark. I think that we are just speeding up the process. Do you agree? Yeah, that's the, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the, the speed of changes is... is mm -hmm. But definitely it's, on, it's a responsibility on us to act and define the model of sustainable development. And but actually, on, uh, when she said that uh, Education in schools not properly. We not educate uh, youngest how they impact. So it's very important to we say in the older people we impact like that, 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 that is the problem. Thank you for your comment and observation and thinking about this topic. Uh, thank you all. Uh, I hope you enjoyed and uh, I wish you successful uh, two more days of the conference on Congress, as you call it. Uh, and you should allocate more time for women panel because you're talkative, so one hour is just... Yeah, I, I was just telling Maya, Maya was actually a keynote speaker last year, she opened the Congress, uh, and I promised her and I, I promised to all of you that next year we will open with this panel. So, <laughs> thank you all.